what's cracking YouTube? You know who it is. It's the big dogs. Gotta eat fantasy football channel. Coming back at you today. Welcome. And what we're gonna get into is some sleepers. Last episode we did top five busts of the 2016 fantasy football season. Today I'm gonna flip the spectrum on you and go the opposite way. Now, like I said last time, I don't like the word sleeper because no such thing as a sleeper. Everybody knows everybody, but I'm gonna use that as this title because I know YouTube does some weird algorithm and that's probably how you guys are gonna find me because everyone searches sleepers and it doesn't matter. Anyways, what I'm talking about is dudes that I think are extremely undervalued and dudes that I just keep finding myself with on my team. You know, these are just guys that keep um, that I keep drafting. Every time I draft, I wind up with them on my team, whether starters or bench players. It um, doesn't matter, and I think they're going to have really, really, really big years. So, without further ado, actually, I'm not going to do all of them today because I have like a huge list, probably like 12 to 15 dudes, and that would take like 48 minutes to do, and no one wants to watch a 48-minute video on YouTube. Um, so I'm going to break it down. I'm probably going to do five today and then maybe next episode do another five or, you know, a couple episodes down the line. Finish out the list. doesn't matter. Anyways, drop the beat, Mickey Mills. y'all didn't think I could set the camera up over here, huh? I know what I'm doing on the sticks. Numero uno on my list of undervalued players is your boy, LaShawn McCoy. That's a million dollar rhyme right there. So, LaShawn McCoy, right now, is going 28th overall. Being picked as like RB10, RB11, which is ridiculous to me because he's the clear three down workhorse in that Buffalo offense. People are having concerns, I guess, with the injuries that he had last year. He played in 11 full games last year while fully healthy. And out of those 11 games, he either had 100 total yards or he scored a touchdown in every single one of them, except for one. So the production was there. I'm not sure what's scaring people off so much. Uh, prior to last year, he played in full 16 games in both 2014 and 2013. Uh, so I'm not gonna say it was last year was a fluke because I never wanna say that for injuries, but he's surely shown that he's capable of playing in a full season. Um, my question is, what's the difference between a LaShawn McCoy and a guy like Doug Martin, uh, or a guy like a, a Mark Ingram, who's gonna be the workhorse? Uh, and, and I argue that McCoy is more upside than them because I think he's more talented. I think he's going to get more receiving work on both of those guys, uh, but they're still being drafted ahead of him, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, now you think about Carlos Williams just being cut. Uh, there goes a bunch of goal line work back to Shady because it's not like they have a bunch of big backs that they're going to you know deploy at the goal line. Carlos Williams fit that bill perfectly, no pun intended, fit that bill perfectly for them last year because he's a big bruiser. This year he just got too fucking fat and now he's off the team. McCoy offers just as much upside. Now, I mean, he offers the same floor, but with more upside than a lot of the guys going above him. You know, his 12.4 fantasy points per game last year was up there in the top 10 or top, uh, top eight, or something like that. So, I mean, the potential, all he's got all the potential in the world. And I think that this Bill's defense is gonna be pretty bad. So he's gonna see a ton of passing work. Uh, I think with Tyrod Taylor back signed, the, the dual threat quarterback is always a huge pickup for running backs. It always, I, I've seen articles and I've seen studies about how a dual threat quarterback positively affects fantasy points for a running back. That's another, another upside for McCoy here. So uh, the fact that he's going all the way into the third round is kind of absurd for me. I would easily take him as my RB1 this year in, in any format. PPR, standard, doesn't matter. Numero dos. <clears throat> Alshon Jeffrey out in Chi-Town. Now Jeffrey is being severely undervalued. Another guy that, you know, has been taken too low because of the injury bug that he's had last year and a little shakeup this preseason. But he's back. He played in the last preseason game and he's going to be fine. 
Now, he played full seasons prior to 2015. 2014, 2013, he played in all 16 games. Um, so it's not like he's never been capable of doing it, and it's not like he's not going to be able to do it in the future. It's not something I'm worried about. And in those two years, he was at, at minimum a top 12 fantasy wide receiver. And right now, he's being picked 21 to 22 overall as wide receiver 12. So he's getting picked where his floor is. I mean, when you're a, when you're sorry, you guys, my uh, my camera <coughs> battery died. I had to put a new one in real quick. So I think the last thing I was saying was that he's being drafted as wide receiver 12, and that's where he's been for the last couple of years. So that's clearly his floor, and it's easy to argue that he's going to build on that. So you're getting to draft him where his floor is. And it's almost a guarantee that he's going to rise above that. So you're automatically getting value there. Um, in the games he played in last year, he was averaging over 10 targets a game. He was racking up over 90 receiving yards a game. And that was with a couple of the games where he, you know, was banged up a little bit, was kind of playing decoy. So those numbers are even deflated more so than they should be. This is a guy who can easily average triple digit yards a game who can easily score 10 to 15 touchdowns given his athletic ability given his red zone ability you know his jumping skills things like that I mean when you just watch the guy if you've ever seen him play he passes the eye test in every way imaginable man he looks like AJ Green out there he tracks the balls he's he gets up he, his vertical is like fucking 80 in inches it's unbelievable just throw the ball up to him let him make a play he's a great possession receiver I'm sorry fucking CVS pharmacy is calling my house gotta pick up my my herpy prescription. I'm going to cut that out. The consistency is there. The talent is there. Things just need to click right. If, if things go his way this season, he stays healthy. There's no reason why he couldn't be a top five wide receiver this year in fantasy. Um, those who argue Kevin White's going to make a difference, you're stupid. First of all, um, all the reports show that all the reports are, are saying that he's not ready to go yet. He, he's a very raw talent and it's being seen in the preseason, he hasn't done anything yet, nothing productive for the team yet. He's not one of Jay Cutler's go-to targets. Um, they lost the tight end position in Martellus Bennett, so they'll have Zach Miller coming in, but Jeffrey should be seeing almost all of the red zone targets there and a huge majority of targets on the outside. I could see him getting 12, 12 targets a game this year and being one of the most targeted receivers in the NFL. Him and Jay Cutler really got some chemistry going um, last year. And I'm super excited to see what Jeffrey can do this year. Numero Trace. Another wide receiver that I love. Not a flashy name. Jeremy Macklin out of Kansas City. He's going around 38 to 40 as wide receiver 19, which is crazy to me. Um, he's now back to back seasons of 85 catches, over 1,000 yards. Eight touchdowns so you know exactly what you're getting from him I'd argue he's one of the safest wide receiver twos if you can get him as a as your wide receiver three you're absolutely golden because then you can take chances with guys with more upside as your wide receiver two um, he's the clear-cut number one there in Kansas City as a passing option and he's finished as uh, he, he was wide receiver 16 last year he was wide receiver nine in the year before that and now he's being drafted as wide receiver 19. People don't love the upside, obviously, and that's why he's getting drafted lower because they want guys who could potentially finish as top five wide receivers. But I argue that I'd rather have Macklin over um, guys with higher ceilings because the floor is just so safe there. Macklin was a little bit inconsistent last year in the beginning of the season, at least. It took him a little while to get going, you know, to get adapted to that offense and everything. But once he was rolling, I do was a savage. He scored six receiving touchdowns in Kansas City's last six games. So six for six. Uh, he averaged over 14 fantasy points per game during that span. One is, he was one of the top receivers uh, towards the end of the season. And you'd have to think that a year under the belt in that offense, that kind of thing is going to continue. They're going to keep feeding him targets, or at least the amount of targets that they possibly can feed in that low-volume passing offense. But, I mean, I love... Love, love Macklin. I keep winding up with him as my wide receiver three um, because he's falling pretty far into drafts into the fourth or fifth round, and I think he's an absolute lock to be valued there at that play. 
What's interesting is they don't pass the ball a lot, but when they do, it's always going to Macklin. He saw, uh, I think, like 22% of their team's red zone targets compared to Kelsey only saw like three targets inside the 10 last year. So Macklin's way more of, uh, of the game plan when it gets to the red zone than any other player on their team. Jamal Charles will be back, obviously, and I think that actually opens up the outside more because he's so dynamic and he's so uh, well-rounded out of the backfield. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think everything is perfect for Macklin there. I think you know exactly what you're getting from him. So he's a player that will, he's not going to lose you any games. He might not win you any games. He's had a couple big weeks. He went over 130 or 40 receiving yards three three different times last year. So he does have a nice little ceiling there, uh, but his floor is just is perfect. It's, it's gorgeous. The revenue is gorgeous with Jeremy Macklin. Go pick him. So let's move on to number four. Indianapolis Colts, running back, Frank the Tank, Gore. Right now, Gore is going at a disrespectful 78 overall. Running back, 25, maybe 27, something like that. It's hard to do these ADPs because there's so many, everyone drafts in different leagues and everyone drafts different formats. Just trying to take a general consensus. Also, quick announcement. Oh, fuck, I threw my monster drink out. I already drank one. But... Like I say every video, if someone is affiliated with Monster, please slide in my DMs. I need you in my life. Anyways, um, Frank the Tank, 33 years old. Let's get it on the table. He's old as shit. I understand that. <clears throat> and being old doesn't work in the NFL. It's not a good thing. That being said, Frank the Tank finished with 967 rushing yards last year. 33 yards shy of 1,000. Now, no one that's 33 has ran for 1,000 yards since, like, 1984. This dude named John Riggins. It's not Tim Riggins' older brother, even though it could have been because he's probably old as shit now. But um, no one's done it in a long time. Frank Gore was super, super close last year. And I think, like, just think of the Indianapolis offense last year. It was no Andrew Luck for the most part. They were, like, really, 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 really bad. So defenses, you know, like, defenses had their way with the Indy, in the offense. And this year you'd have to assume that they're going to have at least, you know, a minimal bounce back, if not a full recovery to the 2014 season when they were so, so explosive. And Frank Gore is literally the only running back in that situation. They drafted Josh Ferguson, uh, but he's strictly a pass catching back in that offense, and he's been horrible in the preseason. So I would not really expect Ferguson to cut into any of Frank Gore's work. Now I'm not saying Frank Gore is going to be the full workhorse there. Um, you know, he's not going to get 25 carries a game because I don't even know if he can. He might drop dead on the damn field if they did that. But he should be seeing 15 to 20 carries a game. I mean, if if things go well, he's not someone who gets injured. He's not. Um, He's not a two-down back. He, he can catch the ball. He's shown that over his career, and I, I think he becomes the, you know, the first thousand-yard rusher at, at his age since, like I said, Johnny Riggs. Johnny Riggs, the homie. Um, one more thing to build on there is they got Ryan Kelly as their center, and there's been so much hype around this dude. He, he was a dude who was clearing holes for uh, Derrick Henry at Alabama, and. Uh, you would expect the offensive line to be much improved from last year, which was a very weak point of their offense. I mean, everything about their offense last year was a weak point, but um, it, it should be overall improvement. You gotta, you gotta say Andrew Luck bounce back, uh, an improved offensive line, and there's just no competition there. All the, all, all the, the, all the what? I can't think of the saying. Everything is just aligning, it's just perfect. It's gorgeous. The revenue is gorgeous, and. Uh, I think Frank's a steal. Like, when can you get uh, f basically a featured running back at at pick eighty? It doesn't. It doesn't happen. But this. But this. This year it does with Frank. Well, pick his ass. And last but not least, if you are still with us, thank you. We're at number five, Marvin Jones, the third. I think he's the third. I think I saw him back of his jersey the other day. Marvin Jones moved to Detroit from Cincinnati. Now there's a lot of moving parts to this move here. Marvin Jones was one of my favorite sleepers when the summer began and I was like, yeah, hey, I'm gonna wind up with him on every damn team and he's gonna be like my big sleeper last year. 
I mean, this year, because I was thinking last year, like, Allen Robinson was that guy for me. Um, but like him, the ADP is absolutely soared up, and now you have to probably reach into the 6th, 7th, 8th round to get Marvin Jones when his ADP started, like, 11, 12. Doesn't matter. You don't care. Um, he's going 80, 80 overall. Wide receiver 20... Wide receiver 33. Even better. Um, so, yeah, obviously Calvin Johnson retiring, leaving 150 targets open, leaving a ton of red zone looks open, leaving those deep ball deep balls open, um, and this is where Marvin Jones comes into play. Marvin Jones is a guy who's 6'1", about 200 pounds, uh, ran a 4'4", 40 at the Combine, which was a bunch of years ago, but he's still super, super fast. He's light on his feet, and he will be the main deep threat there. Uh, a ton of reports out of camp saying that Marvin Jones is actually looking like he's going to pass Golden Tate as the number one receiver in that offense. Um, now, I don't know if I'm willing to go that far, but I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it wouldn't surprise me if Marvin Jones finished the season as a top 15 wide receiver. Yes, a top 15. He's got every opportunity there to absolutely kills expectations this year he's looked so good in the preseason and now he's finally gonna have his chance to you know be be a huge contributor in their offense I mean, he was good in Cincinnati no doubt go back to 2013 he scored 10 touchdowns um, and I don't want to say it's fluky I mean look at last year he wound up with like 65 catches 815 yards and four or five touchdowns as basically the fourth or fifth option in that offense behind A.J. Green, Tyler Eifert, Gio Bernard, you know, the Muhammad Sanu sharing time with him. Like, it, there was so much working against him, and he still found a way to be pretty damn productive. So now he's going to be either, he's going to be the 1A to 1B of Golden Tate. So last year, Calvin Johnson saw 10 targets inside the opponent's 10. He scored a touchdown on five of those. Now, I'm expecting Marvin Jones to get a pretty pretty hefty portion of those of those red zone targets or those by the end zone targets you know because they don't have a lot of other options big options down there i'll we'll have to see when eric e brown comes back if he does come back um i know i was looking at some stats of marvin jones inside the red zone or inside the 10. now he's seen 13 in his entire career it's not a lot it's a small sample size but in his career he's seen 13 targets inside the 10 yard line he's caught 10 of those 13 balls six of them went for first downs and five of them were touchdowns it's a pretty damn good ratio. So, I mean, I think the Lions know what they have in terms of Marvin Jones. He's a super athletic, super quick, can jump very high, and he's a good red zone target. He's going to be their main deep threat. He's going to be seeing tons of targets there. Um, like I said, Calvin's gone, so that's 150 targets up for grabs, and I could see Marvin Jones getting like a pretty, pretty hefty portion of those. Another thing, obviously, to touch on is the coaching change when Jim Bob Cooter took over last year. Um, I mean, I don't know if this dude is magic. I know there are some Cooters out there that can do some magic, but I don't know if Jim Bob is one of them. He upgraded that offense. They were scoring 18 points a game. He took over. That shot up to 26 points per game. Matt Stafford was an absolute stud under him. Um, but, you know, I, I, the schedule that they played from the first half into the second half was like, completely different way easier on the back half uh back the second half the back end of their schedule whatever you want to say um so i'm not going to say that jim bob cooter was everything you know it, 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 that's not what changed it but matt stafford looked very 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 good and i assume he's gonna build on that you know he's got his confidence going um so does the rest of the offense not to mention deandre levy they're like stud Defensive player could be out, and they are really, really, really bad defensively when he's not playing. Um, they had the fifth most pass attempts in the league last year because their defense was pretty fucking bad, and they just were forced to throw the ball, which is not something I'm going to like bank on. That's not why I'm drafting Marvin Jones, but it's just another, you know, another thing to think about. There will be more pass attempts there. So for me, the stars are aligning for Marvin Jones here. Um, just to recap again, like I always do, the key points here, Calvin Johnson's gone. 150 targets are gone. Marvin Jones will be the 1A to Golden Tate's 1B. He's going to be their deep threat. Should take a lot of the red zone looks. And the lines were much improved on offense last year. Matt Stafford looked very, very good. And uh, Marvin Jones is finally getting his chance to shine after playing behind a bunch of studs and stars. And I think it's 
his year to break out. And like I said, wouldn't surprise me to see him finish as a top 15 wide receiver. You heard it here first, baby. Let's get it. As always, thank you for joining me here on the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football YouTube channel. You know, we're here for the the average fantasy player, the more advanced fantasy player. We're here for all y'all. We got love for everybody. We don't discriminate. If you like the video, you know what it is. You know what to do. Share, hit that subscribe button. Tell your friends, tell your kids, tell your wives, tell your girlfriend on the side. You don't care. We just want them numbers up. You know, I'll keep putting this out. You keep showing love. Follow us on, on the Twitter. Actually, I'm going to put it here. Uh, there's no good lighting. Maybe I'll put it up there. Follow us on the Twitter at BDGE underscore Fantasy FB. You can send me a DM. Leave a comment below if you have any questions. I will get back to you. I promise. That is my promise to y'all. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did.